Today's topic, 13 top, the top, financial tips for physicians. This was a fun one to write because it was more or less 13 good ideas or 13 common ideas that continue to pop up, whether with clients or prospects or for presenting uh, to different uh, training programs, just 13 really good ideas. There was an exact template to this where we said, you know, follow this, follow this. So they're kind of scattered all over the place, but there are some really good tidbits in here. Obviously we'll cover the big things like savings and earnings and debt, but I also added a few unique ones, like essentially the biggest one I always say, burnout, right? What, what can we do to combat burnout? Um, nurturing your marriage. Asset protection is a favorite topic for physicians. And usually the best asset protection is date nights. Yep, that's right, date nights. Uh, credit scores, you name it, we're gonna go through it. So again, not a perfect order to this. I'll walk through them one by one, kind of giving some more context on all of them. Uh, as always, we'll link the actual blog post in there, which will have more uh, details as well. So stay tuned, that is all coming up next. All right, first up, number one, increase your earnings. Sounds simple, right? Yeah, it is. But you also got to have the wherewithal to actually ask for more money. And I know that for whatever reason, we kind of get this cold sweat when we hear that, but get paid for your work and what you were worth. Where does this start? I will say I am a huge fan of always hiring an attorney to review your contract. And the one that is usually the least review is that very first contract with, oh boy, it just bothers me because I would say that sets the standard for all your contracts going forward. Everything about that contract will affect the rest of your life. Everything from that point forward should build off of that. So always have your contracts reviewed by an attorney who understands the pricing guidelines all across the US for your specialty. Everything that you have to offer, you should be getting paid for, whether it's travel, whether it's bonuses, whether it's student loans, whether it's RVUs, however your pay is structured. It needs to be fair, but also you, you know, make sure you're getting hopefully a little bit more than what's fair. So the first tip I have is to always be increasing your earnings. Don't be, don't be afraid, don't be scared to ask for more. Um, you can even bring in attorneys that will talk to the hospital, to your, your, your private practice for you if you're not comfortable. Or maybe you just wanna separate yourself or maybe you want more leverage. Whatever the example is, number one, by far one of my favorites, increase your earnings. Number two, save early and often, also known as compounding interest. I don't care where you are in your current medical career, save save today the best time to save more is today because of our best friend called compounding interest even if you're in training and i know that the pay does not match the work that and the hours that you're putting in but get something going if they offer a match to the 403b at least get that going if you can get you know a couple hundred bucks or a couple thousand into a roth ira every year take advantage of it but my second tip start saving early and often because of compounding interest number three Avoid burnout. This one is always one that is very close to my heart, just from conversation that I've had with our clients, um, whether they came to us for a one-time plan or they're currently working with us, but it's just such a real topic, which is why I'm such an advocate for real, real work-life balance and even just mental health, physical health outside of the hospital, and outside of medicine. We have so many things going on, but avoid burnout. That's probably one of the best longevity tips because you're going to, as long as you're a physician, you're going to have great income. But if you burn out too early, you might need a career change. There are all sorts of things that can come in here, stress, anxiety, depression, you name it. Um, between just the hard workload and again, student loans are another thing that just leads to so much stress and so many deep conversations that um, are really sad to even have to talk through uh, because I wish no one had to hear the words burnout or just kind of the stress that even comes from those student loans. But number three, for for so many reasons, make sure you're having a good work-life balance. Make sure that you are finding happiness and peace and love in your current workforce, uh, I mean, your work role, I should say, and really focus on avoiding that, that burnout as much as possible. Obviously, there's gonna be times that you're getting burnt out, um, but just you know, be aware of that, acknowledge that, know when you have to take breaks, know when you have to slow things down where you can. But number three by far, um, this could easily be number one, is to avoid that burnout. Number four, protect your assets with insurance. 
This should not come as a surprise. I hope the word insurance um, has come across in many forms. Uh, so some of the main ones that we listed in the blog post were life insurance, disability insurance, auto insurance, health insurance, homeowners or renters insurance, umbrella insurance. The one that I don't list there in that main list, but you certainly, I hope you have it. If not, we're in a lot of trouble here, medical malpractice insurance. But you should be able to go through a checklist on why you need those. Um, life insurance, if you are young and single and no one co-signed on your loans, maybe you don't need that yet. Disability insurance, disability insurance is pretty much a no-brainer for all of our clients. You know, if you are a physician, your highest asset right now, your biggest, your largest asset going forward is the ability to wake up and go to work every day. Disability insurance protects that. Auto insurance, again, we kind of know what auto insurance does, right? Make sure you have proper auto insurance. Health insurance, you know, make sure that you're utilizing proper health insurance. Maybe you can use a high deductible plan and also get the benefits of an HSA. Homeowners insurance, renters insurance. Renters insurance is the one that sometimes they'll miss or they'll skimp on a little bit. Again, hopefully you never have to use these insurances, but if you do, you're gonna be very thankful that all of your belongings are properly covered. And then umbrella insurance. Again, this is almost built in, not almost, this is built into every single financial plan that I build. You need an umbrella policy. Extra liability has nothing to do with malpractice. So don't, don't think, wow, that's really, really cheap malpractice. No, completely different personal side. So if anything happens you know, at your home, if anything happens even in the home that you rent, uh, your car, that's where umbrella policies are extremely vital for that extra liability. Unfortunately, as a physician, I would say you get an extra target on your back. So having that extra liability insurance um, is a really good and and cost-effective extra form of insurance. Um, just to kind of give you like a high-level overview, the goal is to always protect your net worth. So younger physicians that maybe have student loans, their net worth is not at a million yet, but the baseline policy for everybody is probably around a million-dollar policy. For most, that should be around $200 per year. Um, and then as your net worth grows, even if your net worth is at 1.1 million, I would round up to 2 million because it's just so cost effective. So uh, what number are we on here? Number four, uh, making sure that you protect your assets, and that could even be you, your personal asset, uh, disability insurance, uh, making sure that you're protecting your assets properly with the correct insurances. Number five, where is Dr. Dolly when we need him? Live below your means, or better stated, live like a resident. I want you to enjoy life, but you also need to not get too carried away. That first attending contract, that first attending pay stub is super exciting. Uh, it's one of those moments that I, I think I even sometimes get more excited than our clients just because I know how much time and energy went into just that one piece of paper, whether it's the contract or that first pay stub. But ideally, you're trying to live below your means as much as possible. Continue to save. You don't need to go get the Ferrari yet. You don't need a 14 bedroom house when it's just you and your spouse or just you. You will have opportunities in life if you do this properly to do more things than you probably could have ever dreamed of. But you gotta ease into them. So continue to live below your means and I promise you it'll pay dividends in the long run. Number six, create an investment strategy and stick with it. This really comes back to saving early and often, but it just comes back to don't interrupt compounding interest. Build an investment plan. You know, have a goal in place for your longer term accounts. You know, your Roth IRA, your 403B, your 47B. Have a plan in place for your taxable accounts, which are still accessible, maybe not completely retirement yet, but they're accessible. Have a goal for even just your cash reserves, your emergency fund, right? What's your emergency fund number? But most importantly, stick to it. In your investing life, you will see crazy things. You will see market highs, you will see market lows, you will see markets that go through volatility of 20, 40, 50, 60%, hopefully not more than that. But you will see crazy things. And the key is you have to know that you have a plan in place. That is short-term noise, you're more worried about the long-term plan. So create an investment plan, stick to it, and if you can do that and you don't interrupt that compounding interest, I can almost guarantee that you will be very happy with the long-term results of your investment plan. Number seven, get out of debt and or avoid debt. So this would be where we look at, we see there's really two forms of paying off debt. Now, if you are if you have student loans and you're going for public service loan forgiveness, you can kind of carve those out, right? They're, they're not really in this conversation. But if you have credit card debt, if you have personal loans, 
if you have private student loans that are not going to go for any type of forgiveness, or if you have federal loans that are eventually going to become private loans that aren't going to get any type of forgiveness. That's really what we're looking at here. You can eventually get to your mortgage. Usually your mortgage is probably your lowest rate that you have. Um, and I'm okay with paying mortgages off more aggressively, but I also want to make sure that you're on track for your long-term investment goals. So that's why I just wouldn't really include the mortgage here, at least from a broad uh, topic conversation. But there's two ways to look at this. Uh, there's what I call the APR method, which pretty much says, what's your highest interest rate? In that, that example, it's likely any type of credit card debt, then probably a personal loan, and then probably any private student loans. In that APR method, you're pretty much going after the highest loan interest rate first, and then once that's paid off, go to the next one. Once that's paid off, go to the next one. So I call that my, my APR method. And that's, that's more or less Finance 101. That's, that's the proper way to do it. But again, there, there's, there's more than one way to financial success. The other way would say you find the lowest balance and you pay that off because it just kind of gives you that, yeah, we got it done. There's one out of the way. Let's go to the next one. All right, got that one out of the way. Let's go to the next one. So there's two ways to do it. Again, Finance 101, textbook response, always pay the highest interest rate. But I can tell you, we've had plenty of clients that have had a lot of success with just paying off the lowest balance and continuing to go, continue to go, continue to go. So whatever works for you, I don't care how you do it, but just get that debt out of your way and try to avoid as much debt possible, avoid as much debt as possible going forward. All right, number eight, we're getting personal now. Get married without breaking the bank. Where did this one come from? Well, truthfully, uh, we cleaned up a few older blog posts and I wrote a really good blog post, like one of our very first ones, on just kind of keeping your budget low for, for, um, for weddings. There, it may be one of the most magical times of your life. More than likely, I'd say it's probably one of your top three, right? E even after you have kids, depending on how many kids you have, it's, it's gonna be a top event forever. But just don't go too crazy. Now, I know some cultures, we have a lot of clients uh, that are of uh, Indian heritage, and I know Indian weddings are wild, and the budget can jump up there. But I know that there's also a big family tie to that, and that's more of their culture. So I, I don't want to break traditions here. So when that comes into play, obviously, we talk through that. Um, but just always be aware, right? It's kind of a once-and-done event. So don't get too crazy with it. Hopefully, hopefully there's some family help in there as well. Um, we kind of put a tip in the blog post, and this more or less may have been a tip from from my own personal wedding with my wife. Um, don't get too crazy with flowers. I'm always amazed by how many people will spend so much money on flowers. And I'm like, they do die. They don't last forever. So my one area to save easily is always on flowers. But again, it's more or less to make you aware. Um, I know most of you are going to hear this, and you're like, huh, I'm I'm dropping six figures on that thing. So main goal here for number eight is just be aware of the cost with your wedding. Try to keep them as low as possible while still having a fantastic time burning down that dance floor. I know how it goes, uh, but just keep an eye on the cost for that, for that wedding budget. Number nine, the one that we all wish someone would have told us about when we were 16, 17, 18 years old, uh, preparing to sign paperwork for loans and six figures that we realized, oh boy, we got to pay those back. But try to minimize your education cost, both for for us and for our children. So if you're watching this or if you work with us, you're likely already finished up medical school um, or maybe you're finishing medical school and you're just catching up on our blog or our YouTube channel. Um, but try to minimize cost where you can. For most of us as we sit here now, we start to transition, right? We gotta think through our kids now. How do we, how do we save them from this burden? So just be aware of the cost of education. Just see what else is out there. Um, you know, I would say community college, they're not the, the sexiest thing out there, but I'm just amazed by how many people don't use community colleges. Um, even if it's for a few years early on, and then maybe they transition or over to a larger uh, school of some capacity. There's plenty of great state schools out there. You know, myself, I'm a, a Penn Stater, uh, we are. So I got a great education from a state school and it kept my cost very low. Uh, my, my, my debt burden was very low. Now, and truth be told, I, you know, if I would have got accepted to an Ivy League, maybe I would have went to an Ivy League, but I'm just not that smart. So I uh, ended up getting my education from a fantastic state, state school uh, at Penn State. So just be aware of the cost of education for yourself. Again, we may be past that point by the time you're watching this, but thinking forward to even that next generation, just be aware of those costs. Number 10, I love this one. Give your children a financial head start. So how can we help our kids get off on the right foot? So we listed a few items in the blog post, which again, we'll link to the actual video notes as well, but you can open a checking and a savings account in their name. 
Again, assuming that they're, they're age and majority here, you can even open them when they're minors. Uh, there's different ways to do it. Every state's a little bit different too, but um, open a checking and savings account. Let them see what happens if they put money in the bank and it grows interest. Encourage them to get a job. If they get a job and earn income, they can then contribute to a Roth IRA. One of my favorite things that I tell our parents is have, have a match. As the cool parents that I know that you are, if you have children right now, if they can put $1,000 into their Roth IRA and they're willing to understand that they put money in, match them. Give them $1,000. Don't we all wish we had a 100% match? Give them a match of that. you know, Or even say, hey, if you go earn X dollars, I'll actually go put this money in there uh, for you. You don't have to put anything in there. Because remember, as long as they earn income, when you put money into the Roth, they don't really know where it came from per se. Now, if they only earn $5,000 of income, you can only put that amount in. But here's a great opportunity to take advantage of a Roth at a very young age. Talk about compounded interest on steroids here. Uh, really get that really cranked up for them. Uh, you can add them as an authorized user on a credit card. And you can plug in a credit limit too. So if your kids do want to have a little flexibility with a credit card and they get to go out with their friends and you say, hey, you, you can use this to pay for, for your dinner that night, put a limit on there so that they don't go crazy and you, know, you find out that they just bought every Apple product at Best Buy, you can put a, a limit on that. So add them as an authorized user. Uh, put a utility bill in their name. Um, you can actually have them maintain a permanent address. I'm amazed by how many, and I made this mistake too, so you can tell I learned uh, post-college here. But in college, I used to change my address all the time. That's not ideal. So you could have actually, if my, I should have just continued to list my, my mom's address as my permanent address. So those are little things that I didn't even know about, but that can also be really helpful when you're applying for a credit card as opposed to having four addresses in four years. So number 10 here, uh, give your children a financial head start by utilizing some of those tips. Again, depending on the age, some may be more available today, some may be more available down the road, but all those little things help. Uh, don't we all wish we could have started with a little bit better credit score? And these are things that can help them with that. Number 11, speaking of credit scores, raise or maintain your credit score. So again, today credit cards will make our credit score more readily available than it probably was you know, just a few years ago. So you probably have a good idea what your credit score is. But see, are there any opportunities to improve it? More importantly, when's the last time you looked at your credit report? If you have a credit score that you're like, hey, I keep doing everything right, what the heck is going on here? Take a look at your credit report. Maybe there's something on there that needs to be cleaned up or it's not correct. But always try to keep a solid credit score. I mean, we're aiming towards 800 or higher here. Um, and if it's not there, see what you can continue to be doing to make improvements there and where you can make those improvements. That credit score is a very simple three digit number but I can tell you it can save you thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars of your lifetime in just lower interest rates. Whether it's your mortgage, whether it's your student loans, whether it's your credit cards, that little simple number affects a lot of things. So make sure you're getting that high and keeping it high. Number 12, pursue low cost hobbies. As I say, it sounds boring, but it probably is important. Uh, and I, I actually included a list on here because I, as I was thinking through it, on paper it made sense, but again, I was like, that, that sounds kind of boring. Um, you know, if you have a boat hobby, boats are expensive. If you have a golf hobby, this is probably my weakness here, uh, golf's pretty expensive. Sure, you kind of get clubs every few years, but you customize those and you're going to the nicest you know, courses, you add in the country club, right? Add it in the country club it starts to add up, right? Compared to the individual that has the hobby of bird watching. Bird watching, probably pretty cheap, right? Go to the local bird watching area. Um, I don't know the proper terms here. Probably should have picked a better example. But look for hobbies. And, and, and maybe it's, it's not, you, you give up all the expensive hobbies just to do low cost hobbies. But try to sprinkle those in because that'll help. And also as we kind of look toward later retirement years, probably gives you even more flexibility to really enjoy that retirement. So check out some low cost hobbies to see if we can plug any of those in there. Number 13, my absolute favorite, nurture your marriage. I know I joked about it in the very early intro here. Physicians, whether we are talking to the residents, the fellows, or the attending of 20 years, we always get the question, but Chad, how do I add in better asset protection? And I usually respond with, well, first of all, one, getting sued, not uncommon, not, but not very common. Getting sued above your malpractice limits, not that common at all. So were you more likely to lose your money? 
malpractice suit above your limits or divorce. I'll tell you right now, it's divorce by a long shot. So nurture your marriage. Find low cost hobbies. See what I did there? Bird watching. Anyway, but find, find something that you guys love to do together. Go on date nights, go travel the world. Whatever keeps that fire going for you guys, keep it going, baby, because I can tell you that that is your biggest asset protection tool. And also, it's just way more fun having a spouse that you get to enjoy life with or a partner that you get to enjoy life with. So number 13, which again, I probably could have put this as number one as well, nurture your marriage. And there you have it. 13 of the top financial tips for our physicians. Again, not a perfect format to this post, but sometimes a little bit more fun that way anyway. So walking through 13 great tips that many of you can put in play. Maybe all 13 don't apply to you just based on your current situation, but as life evolves, things change. So you have those. So as always, thanks for tuning in. If you have not subscribed to our channel, please take the opportunity to subscribe. If you have not liked our video, now would be a great time to like this video. Both of those help us in the YouTube world and it helps us get out to more physicians so that we can help more physicians just like you. As always, thanks for tuning in and I will catch you on the next video.